We're going to start with a little film here called Wingtip the Canopy, because these guys, uh, you know, flew. We're going to talk about the last of the F-4 era, which was very, very colorful in 1972-73 time frame, and then the actual transition to the A-4. So let's run Wingtip the Canopy. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Lieutenant John Patton, narrator of the United States Navy Flight Demonstration Squadron, the Blue Angel. For more than 60 years, the United States Navy has kept abreast of aviation technology by flying the most modern aircraft available from both land-based installations and aircraft carrier flight decks the world over. Spanning the last 27 years, a select group of naval aviators have had the opportunity to demonstrate the precision techniques of naval aviation to the public, hoping to inspire our young men and women to choose careers in the United States Navy. Now, if I may direct your attention to the ramp before us, I ask that you observe the manner in which the six demonstration pilots approach their aircraft, are saluted by their crew chief, and receive last-minute instructions on the status of their assigned aircraft. The precision maneuvers you will see demonstrated here this afternoon are coordinated tactical techniques developed in training and in actual combat by our Navy and Marine Corps pilots. In combat, these maneuvers might be flown from treetop level to 60,000 feet. But for the team, it is a continuous demonstration of their skill and training in a very low altitude environment. The aircraft you will see being flown here this afternoon is the McDonnell Douglas A4F Skyhawk, a single seat, light attack aircraft, versions of which have been operational with the United States Navy and Marine Corps since 1955. Okay, one of the reasons we ran that quite a while is because you saw several of the people that aren't available here. Go ahead and take your seats up there, guys. But, uh, and so you got a chance to take a look at them, like uh, our beloved Admiral Les, who wasn't able to make it here, and also uh, Marlon Wieda, and we have John Ch Smoke Chahansky, and Vance Parker, and who am I missing? One more. Oh, John Fogg, exactly. And so you had a chance to see those guys in action there, and also to get reminded of, you know, what was our, really is the mission of the Blue Angels. So we did it there. Okay, so the F-4 era. We heard all about it here. And somebody was just telling me in the back that during the years of the F-4, uh, from 69 to 73, we dropped 21 of them. That's a lot of airplanes. Okay. And so in the last two years, we lost eight. Eight airplanes in two years. The good news is, McDonnell Douglas was making 72 a month. <laughs> and they were making it for the Marines, the Air Force, and the Navy. But, you know, things were a lot different back in those days. But it became a, a situation that um, Steve Lambert here from 73 is going to run us through as to why we needed to transition to the A-4. Steve. Th thanks, Gil. Uh yeah, 73 uh, was a tough year for us. Um, lost some airplanes and had a couple of the pilots killed along with one of the uh, maintenance guys. And so it was a very tough time for us. Uh, when we got back to uh, Pensacola, there was a state of confusion. We really didn't know what was going to happen next. Uh, what happened next was uh, the Navy and the Air Force both convened a meeting in Pensacola, and that meeting was to determine whether to keep the teams going. So as they started their discussions, to me sitting there watching it, I could see it was going south. And it looked like to me that uh, there was no chance that they were going to keep the teams in play. And uh, as they went along, it got worse and worse. And uh, finally, the uh, the head of the recruiting command, a uh, black shoe admiral, which uh, helped out because the, you know they wouldn't look at him as uh, you know being prejudiced towards aviators and everything. And he got up and he said, 
I've listened to what all of you have said and everything, but uh, I'm just going to tell you right now, if you shut the Blue Angels down, we're going to lose all of our recruiting efforts are going to go south. And uh, every time the Blues show up at an air show site, the next day after they leave, we got people lined up to sign up to be aviators. And uh, all that's going to go away if you shut down the Blue Angels. And uh, since the fact that he was a black shoe, you know, it, it really helped the fact that he wasn't an aviator and uh, would sway anybody. About the time he finished his presentation, the Air Force guy running the uh, recruiting command for the Air Force stood up and said, hey, I agree what he's saying 100%. If you shut down the Thunderbirds, we're going to have the same problem. There's no way that we can recruit Air Force pilots if, if we uh, shut down both teams. So all of a sudden, the mood changed. All of a sudden, you could just feel going through the audience that everybody started going, hey, you know, we need to keep the teams going. So that decision was made, but now the next thing is, okay, what airplane are we going to fly? So the candidates were the A-4, the F-14, and the A-7. So Admiral Ferris, who was Sinatra, called me up and said, Steve, uh, I want you to fly into uh, Corpus and fly the uh, A-4 and tell me what you think. And uh, so I did that, and uh, Marlon Wieda went off to uh, fly the A-7 and check it out. And uh, we, we really didn't, I, I don't think the F-14 was ever in, in play. So I went out and sat in the front seat of an of a A-4 with a instructor pilot uh, from their community sitting in the back and, and uh, went through all the maneuvers and I knew right then and there that that should be the airplane. So I went back and told Admiral Ferris, I said, I don't think there's any challenge here at all as, as to what airplane should be flown. It looked, I said, the A-4 is perfect for what we're doing. I went through all the maneuvers and uh, it, uh, I was, couldn't be more happier with the, what the airplane was capable of doing. So the decision was made at that time to go to the A-4, so that was a good news for everybody. So when you went with the A-4, uh, what uh, changes did you have to make to the airplane, JP? The, uh, the big uh, change was obviously the flight control system with the spring, and um, the slats got bolted up. You all know on the A-4 the slats are aerodynamic, and we just couldn't have the slats going in and out at various times during the air show. So the slats were bolted up and uh, it was quite an airplane just of interest to everybody that has flown various airplanes. And your, the thrust to weight, I mean the airplane weighed 10.5 and we had P408 engines that had 11.2 thrust. So at a low weight, which you probably wouldn't do in the fleet, you'd get down to uh, 500 pounds of gas and you had a real airplane there, which was pretty <laughs> impressive. Okay, uh, so you took the hump off too, right? The A4 had the hump when, with the That's ECM gear? The A4 Echo had a, a big avionics hump in the back and the hump came off and we also installed uh, the drag chute which was a pretty impressive uh, thing to, to see because you could stop the airplane in less than a thousand feet. Now, I know from personal experience that one of the things about that drag chute was doing a delta landing on the A4. How many A4 guys are out here? Yeah, there you go. So, when you got there, and the boss needed to shoot as you're coming in there at 150 knots instead of 140, which would be normal speed. When you touch down and you uh, blew a tire or something happened, they say, boss needs to shoot. You have to go back row shoots, two and three shoots, and then you could pull your shoot. <laughs> By that time, it was kind of a scary situation. 
Luckily, it never happened except in my dreams, okay? That, <laughs> <laughs> the bad dreams. Okay, so Chuck, uh, the change in the squadron. Going to a squadron. Now, because of the situation, losing all the airplanes and the leadership issues, they decided uh, to go to a full squadron. And actually, all of you comment on uh, why they did that and uh, how it came about. Well, that's that's uh, correct. We were, uh, we were, you know, the Blue, the Blue Angels was basically a unit, standalone, and uh, was not a squadron. Uh, but uh, after uh, July 26, 1973, we. First of all, we, we weren't real sure we were going to be around much longer. That became, that was the question. Then we decided to add the team, then, then the question was, okay, uh, now, what, what are we, what are, what are we, what are, what are we going to do in this, in this, uh, in this transition? You know? And, um, and the, and the, the conclusion, uh, you know, became that uh, we would be, we would be moved from, into as a regular squadron, and the and the I think the key to being successful in that transition was Tony Less, and Tony Less because of his his personality and his 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 willingness to, and, and communications uh, with all of us, and I think that uh, you know most of the guys uh, agree with that, and. And so we transitioned to a to a squadron, which really brought, in some ways, more more order to what we what we were doing, uh, going going forward. And that was that was it. That was the that was the key, I think, was le leadership and the idea of becoming a more orderly and recognized unit. And the fact that uh, Tony was ten years older than the rest of you. <laughs> that probably helped. Yeah. Uh, we had so, no idea what we were doing. Yeah. So the, both of you guys here, the other two guys, just let's talk about Tony a little bit. Uh, he's he's a, my hero, always has been, and uh, the first guy to really do this, and, and the Blues uh, went from maybe not existing to going all the time to 75 years, much to, because of Tony. What was different having Tony in there as, as a leader? Well, I don't think uh, I could really describe it, except that he was a real leader. I mean, Tony was had a had a family, had four girls, and um, Leanne, his wife, were a hundred percent supporters, including the uh, the four girls who were uh, who were young at the time, and his uh, his ethics were just above most of all of us. I mean, he. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't know exactly how to say that, but uh, <laughs> but talk about the straight shooters in the world. He was he was one of them, and I think all of us, including you know, all many of you out there, were very proud to serve with him. Just a comment regarding the transition to a squadron. One of the requirements on Bill Newman 78-79 uh, was that you had to have command of a tactical aircraft squadron, which prior to that there was an officer in charge of the Blues. Now, as a commanding officer, you already had to have, have had command of a fleet squadron. By the way, this is an uh, all-inclusive. Anybody who's got a question at any time, Bring it up. Uh, we'll pass this. We will pass this around, and so everybody can get involved with this. But uh, that whole idea of um, as we can go, as Bill was talking about, as the older fella, when you show up there, you know you've already had that experience of uh, having a lot of people working for you, and you uh, become now the guys are going to look at this, and you become oh my bubba's over there. Sometimes I would say you got fifty one percent of the vote. Okay, and sometimes that's needed, okay? So, um, Steve, back to you. Did you fly both the uh, F-4 and the A-4? Uh, no. Okay, but John, you did. Okay, no? I was a, uh, I was a fleet uh, F-4 guy on my first tour. I right. had three cruises. 
was down in Key West as an instructor pilot for the, for the RAG, an ACM instructor, and I had uh, uh, some A-4 time because there were A-4 Echoes that we used as adversary aircraft. So when I pulled into the parking lot for the first time in Pensacola, the last two blue F-4s were taken off for Cherry Point. I mean, I watched them roar by right in front of me. So I never flew a blue F-4. And it's, uh, and in fact, I was the, uh, in 74, I was the narrator. So I didn't fly in an air show in 74, but I did in 75 and 76. And uh, the narrator, let me tell a funny story. Go for that's it. That's all right. That's what it's all about. <laughs> so, so this is one of the stories I relate just as a big joke. And as a narrator, I had uh, the number seven jet which was the newest jet that I ever flew. It arrived in Pensacola with 6.3 hours, and uh, that was it. And uh, 158722, not many of you have flown it. And uh, so I got to put the next uh, 500 hours on it, and a great airplane. So in the early part of uh, January and February, when the narrator goes out to all the air show sites and hands them the uh, little checklist of what they have to do. It's, uh, we were gonna do a show in Las Cruces, New Mexico. So I landed at Holloman, and because of the fuel crisis, every military base was PPR for fuel. And that was just something that, that happened. So I landed at Holloman and uh, taxied into the transit line and uh, jumped out, didn't have PPR for anything. And it's prior permission required, by the way. <laughs> so the, uh, I see this black sedan pulling up, and this colonel, the base CO, jumps out, and here's his speech, you know. Who in the hell are you? I mean, you can't waltz in here in a blue airplane and a blue flight suit and not have PPR, and uh, wh what are you doing? Who do you think you are? And I was, I'm a lieutenant, so I was trying to be pretty nice, and uh, I said, just as sarcastically as I could, sir, I don't need any fuel. Yeah. <laughs> and the number seven jet, we had two wing tanks and a starter pod on the center line, so we didn't need much uh, support at all. And that was one of the highlights of my... Uh, <laughs> When we went to Air Force Base, which you guys can all rec we, we recognize, you know, the, the guy in charge was the guy with the most radios hanging on his belt. You know, it wasn't about how much, what his rank was, you know, because they were always having to do that. But So, uh, in, um, Chuck, when you, when you were uh, the events coordinator over there, uh, what were some of your stories for uh, adventures as far as getting things done? And did you have to ride with this guy around to where uh, the shows were? Yes. <laughs> well, one of the things that, that had to occur in this transition uh, was uh, uh, the link to the show sites. So that's when we started doing winter visits. And the reason for doing that was, guess what? I'd like to get my uh, eyes on the guy I was going to be talking to for the next six months or eight months and would end up seeing one week before the show so that we had some kind of a real relationship with each other. And, and that's, that evolved from, from theirs, having that, it was communications. Well, did you have any, uh, you know, bad times where things didn't go so well? <laughs> Only every airship site, but <laughs> no, not, not really. Nothing that was not able to be overcome. Was, uh, I'll throw in Soupy Campbell in here that uh, he got in so much trouble at uh, this little place in uh, Indiana that they actually had a dartboard up with his picture on and they were throwing it at him. <laughs> Remember that, Soupy? <laughs> That's a personal problem. That's because he was, he was going to, they had grown some trees that would go a lot taller than they were two years before when we were at, the, at that air show site. So he told them, you got to cut those trees down. That's when the dartboard came up. So, um, what uh, maneuvers did we lose going from the F-4 to the A-4? What couldn't we perform with the A-4? Well, 
function of the on-off switch. <laughs> that, that was one of the things. The microphone turned on and off with that. We lost that. I, I can say that uh, definitely uh, what those guys talked about in the previous thing, the trailed loop was probably one of the most difficult uh, maneuvers. And so going when they switched over to the A4, they eliminated that. And for damn good reason, I can tell you. That was a hard, hard maneuver. And I can't think of anything else that they shut down. Dirty loop? Didn't do it. it scared the hell out of me. It's, uh... <laughs> Okay, so um, as far as the roll rate, you know, the A4, we're looking at 700 degrees a second, and now these boys are dealing with like 230 degrees a second, which sounds pretty impressive, right? But it's not. I mean, and the A4 had that ability to yug, cancel, and roll four times. Yeah, so that, that's one of the most impressive things about the whole A4 show was that roll rate you had out there. And the, the other part of it, and, uh, and let's talk a little bit about maintenance with the A4 versus the F4. Can you compare those? Well, I can say in, in, the, uh, in the fleet, I mean, it was a continuous problem. And in the uh, A4, we pretty much had airplanes up, just like the 69 team, when they say they had six airplanes. We, had, uh, we actually had eight airplanes total, and uh, with a number seven, a two seat. And, uh, I'll, I'll tell you something funny. Another funny story here. Now, if John Fogg were here, he would relate this story. But we went out to the A4 rag in uh, Lemoore, and they had some old TA4s that just had a regular canopy close. So we got back to Pensacola, and VT4 loaned us some airplanes, some new, like, training command, TA-4s, and Foggy took off on his first uh, first flight in a TA-4 there at Pensacola, and he had never seen a rifle bolt, had no idea what that was, and so he takes off, and as soon as he lifts off, the canopy goes, blows off right there, and uh, got back and said, Hey, I, you know, I, I don't know what, I've never seen a rifle bolt. I don't know what that is. And sure enough, that was uh, the new way to lock the canopy. And he had never seen it. And like I say, if he were here, he'd tell the story. <laughs> well, he did ask me whether this is going to be taped or not. <laughs> and I'm going to be very happy that that was revealed. Okay. So, from the audience, anybody out there with any questions at all regarding either the transition to the F-4 or about the A-4 itself? Thanks, boss. I'm just going to go back to Tony Less. I had the pleasure of being on the Independence uh, when Tony was a skipper of VA-12. And uh, everybody loved him, had great respect. I was in VA-65. And so Tony gets deep selected, you know, and he's going to go to the Blues, and everybody knows that's the talk of the ship. So we come back, and I was on the same cycle with him, and we're down in AI debriefing, and I hear all this grousing, and I go, what's going on? He goes, geez, this guy's going to kill us. I go, what do you mean? He says, he's trying to practice this Blue Angel stuff. He hasn't even been there yet. <laughs> so he goes, he goes, hey, Skipper, you're taking us over the top. we got no airspeed. We're falling out of the sky like leaves. And... Tony doesn't even look up, and he's doing the book, and he goes, I guess you guys aren't very good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anybody else? Paul Trude. Yep. Yeah, for maybe Steve and JP. Steve, uh, first of all, how long did you stay on afterwards? Uh, I stayed on uh, for, uh, for a little while, uh, uh, just to kind of help with the transition and everything, and... Uh, and like everybody said, uh, as soon as Boss Les came aboard, it, you could tell that uh, he was the right person. There, there was no doubt about that. And uh, so I worked with uh, some of the new guys on some of the maneuvers and uh, went re really smooth. And uh, it was a kind of easy transition for everybody because uh, it had good, good leadership and good guys coming back on the team. So it worked out really good. But... Yeah, JP, uh, you know, 
when you come aboard, your new guy, your number two, which used to be always a Marine. I don't know where that went, but um, <laughs> anyway, you you know, first year you don't know anything. Second year you train a new boss. Uh, Ken Wallace was very in instrumental. Did he fly in the? How did he get Boss Les up to speed? Did he fly in the formation or or what? I think most of you are uh, aware that you know, in general, you've got the the previous boss to kind of train the new boss. Plus, you've got a number two that uh, can help out on the, training the boss. But uh, in 1974, we didn't have a boss to train the new boss. So Ken Wallace helped out. and uh, Boss Les and Ken flew by themselves several times. I mean, in separate airplanes. And went out and he kind of, uh, Captain Wallace was just kind of showing uh, boss less what the maneuvers look like I mean you know what should the bottom look like and just the two of them did that and then uh, Ken never flew in a uh, you know in a diamond or Delta with anybody he just primarily trained the boss and kind of helped out to giving some uh, some pointers on how the Blue Angel organization worked So it's Saturday today, NCAA football is going on everywhere. Just want to remind you that Tony Les was an outstanding quarterback at Findlay University in Ohio. Yes, he was. In fact, I took him back there at one point in a, my little Cirrus airplane, and we landed at Pittsburgh, and then he ran off to Findlay to do some, because uh, he was the captain of the football team, and they were honoring him for that. Of course, he'd never let you know that, except that I was flying with him, and we were uh, coming in in really bad weather into Pittsburgh, and we went down, and we landed, and it was raining like crazy and everything, and there was a 737 right behind us, and I, we lied about our airspeed coming down <laughs> through all this stuff. And this guy is running up on me, and there's a high-speed taxiway, and I go, uh, Tony, I'm just going to land on this high-speed taxiway so that guy doesn't run over me. And anyway, we had a great conversation. I got to know him so much during that time, and... Like I said, he's a real hero. I wish we could have had him here, both he and Leanne. But uh, anyway, hats off to him. Okay, any other questions? Here we go. Boss, just building on something that Boss Newman was talking about, Mick actually pointed out, it, it's probably uh, good to point it out. When these guys made the transition to a squadron, the first time you bring in a whole new command structure, and they went from being a, a team to being a full Navy squadron, the only thing they did not do because of the number of people was get an X up. So you had now a command master chief, you had a CEO. Well, break, break, however many years later, when the team was being reevaluated for a number of reasons, one of the things they did that up the chain of command and some of the investigations was go back and look at this transition and how successful of it was that what they had done. And the decision made was made then by the four star doing the review that the one thing I wish they had done then was get an XO, and that's how the XO came onto the team now but it was because of the success that was displayed by this group that maybe at the time, about 10 years ago, said, what can we do to make the current team better? And that's how the impetus for the XO coming onto the team was. So again, your work has legs. Still does. Nice guys. All right, well done. Okay. Hi, my name's Casey Jones. I relieve Tony Glass, and I, I second everything everyone said about Tony. The question was asked earlier. I, I had the team on the third and fourth year of the A4. Uh, the question was asked, what did, could you not do in the A4 that you could do in the F4? That question should be asked the other way around. Uh, the five-plane line of breast loop was introduced in, I think it was in 75, 76 rather, 77. No. 77. Johnny's going to keep me straight here. I'm even going to talk about F4s, I mean a, uh, solo maneuvers. We did a back-to-back, -back, they did, the solos did a back-to-back -back roll in the A4. Denny Sapp. Uh, introduce that maneuver. They did the, uh, the, the inverted tuck away breaks. That was new. You did uh, the t inverted tuck over break. You did the uh, 
opposing blivid, in other words, outside half cubinate opposed and recovery. Uh, we, of course, did the delta landing on virtually every flight. I think it was a 200-foot wide runway you had to do it. And uh, I believe that was you that piped up and asked uh, JP whether you reduced power on the landing. But uh, a six-plane landing was a normal thing in the A-4. Uh, can you help me with anything else new that we didn't do? Yeah, clean loop, dirty loop. In other words, one airplane with the gear and flaps down. Of course, we did the dirty roll on takeoff as well. Uh, and the other thing that I particularly liked about the A4 show is that the airplanes never left sight of the crowd. We had to do a, an energy conservation type show where you came off of a high reversal into the next maneuver in order to have the, the speed to do the whatever the maneuver might have been. Of course, we did a changeover roll. We did a li uh, left echelon roll. Um, and as you transition from the four-plane diamond maneuvers and began to integrate a solo in that maneuver, if you were in the crowd, all you had to do is look up there and see four airplanes with a solo joining inverted to come out and roll out in a five-plane line of breast loop. The, uh, I live, Janice and I live in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, which is, I'm sure you all know, is an Air Force town. And the, the first thing when they learn that I was with the Blue Angels, the first thing they say is, the blues are a lot better than the Thunderbirds. <laughs> and then the, the next thing they say is that what we appreciated the most was you never left sight of the crowd. And those join-ups were the most amazing thing that you can imagine to see someone rendezvousing upside down. So uh, I have a lot of experience with the team, and I'm... I'm very fond of them, and we get together periodically, and uh, I think they're a great bunch of guys. Thanks, Katie. Boss, okay. do you want to know what the real difference is in the, like, the 74 team and the current team? Now, this is really serious stuff. We had our pins on our left pocket, on our left shoulder. And yesterday you saw everybody, they have their pins on the right shoulder. It's a big deal. I think, I think you need to submit a NATOPS change to their manuals to get them uh, squared away. I think that's about all the time we have here.